Alright guys, the reason I wanted to give you sheets of paper is because today I'm going to be preaching on the rapture, on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, what is the most prevalent position of the rapture in this day and age? If you guys know, it's the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? The pre-tribulation is the most prevalent position, and it's been the most prevalent position amongst Baptists for the last 100 years or so. Okay? But before that, before 100 years ago, before 19, about 1912, the post-tribulation rapture was the most prevalent position amongst Baptists. Okay? Things changed in the early 1900s with the advent of fundamentalism, with the change, I mentioned a couple of things to you before, uh, the difference between uh, liberal Christianity and fundamentalism, where around the same time that it started, so did the doctrine of dispensationalism. Okay? And if you know, you probably don't even know what that word is, if you don't know, that's okay. But basically, uh, dispensationalism is a man-made theology used to interpret the Bible. And based on that man-made theology, not on the words of God, but based on the man-made theology, that's where they created the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? So one of the key differences with our church that makes us very different is that, uh, I think you all believe, I'm not sure if it's all of you, but we all, you know, I certainly believe that the rapture is post-tribulational. That Jesus Christ will come back after the tribulation. And the reason I've given you some sheets and some pens is because I want you guys to know, it's not that difficult, alright? But I want you to know exactly when Jesus Christ is coming back. What the Word of God says. And I'm not going to give you my opinion, we're going to be going through scriptures, and you're going to be filling out these boxes on your own, Okay? And then in your own time, when you get home, you can take these and study it out uh, further for yourself. But notice we've all these, there's a few empty boxes, you've got a lot, a lot of empty boxes here. Each box has a number and a letter, right? just want to give you an introduction to that. Like the first box on the top right is 1A, you know, and then when you look at the bottom, the, you know, the bottom left, it's 9B, for example. Okay, so you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're going to be focused primarily on the top uh, table the top table, and then we're going to be looking at the bottom one later on, okay? And I also expect this sermon to play out for two weeks. So, uh, part one is today, and part two will be next week. So let's start off by establishing just some very simple things that the Bible teaches us, okay? Um, now, if you've got your Bibles, that'd be awesome, uh, but I'm not going to get you to necessarily turn to, turn to all the references, because we do have a lot of references to go to. So I've got the help of my computer here, and I've got the verses up so I can get through them pretty quickly. But if you notice... Also on this page, all those references are there as well. So if you don't have time today to go through the references, again, you can go home and study this out for yourself. Okay? Now, if you notice the diagram, there's a little picture there okay, of a sun that's dark, a moon, and stars that look like they're falling, maybe a meteor shower. Okay? Now, this is, this is an event in the Bible that's spoken out throughout the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. Okay? There are four references in the Old Testament that speak about this event, and there are five references in the New Testament that speak of this event. It's a very important event, and in my, uh, in my time growing up in churches, hearing about the second coming of Christ, hearing about the rapture, I never heard... Uh, this uh, being taught about the sun and moon being darkened and the stars falling from heaven, although it's found throughout the whole Bible. Okay, we're going to be looking at a couple of passages uh, today as well. So, if you notice, I've, I've put that picture on the fourth uh, column, right? The fourth column, all right? So, this will, it, it all starts to make sense once we uh, sort of go through it. But I just want to read a couple of passages to you. I'm going to start with Isaiah 13, verse uh, 9 and 10. The Bible says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, uh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now look at verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cease, her, shall not cease, uh, shall not cause her light to shine. So we, here we have in Isaiah this reference of the sun and moon being darkened and the stars and the constellations also being darkened. Okay? So I just want you to notice that this is an important part and notice how it mentioned the day of the Lord there in verse number 9. Now I'm going to read to you another passage just in Joel 2 verse 1. Joel 2 verse 1. The Bible says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. 
Now I'm going to skip down to verse number 10 because just there's too much to read there. But verse number 10 it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So you have another reference there in the Old Testament, the book of Joel. In fact, the book of Joel mentions this quite a number of times about this very important event to come. And again, you could see that it's associated with the day of the Lord. It said, the day of the Lord cometh. All right. Now, one thing that I want to establish here is um, just in full B. So if you look down, just underneath your diagram, there in, in box number 4B, right? Not 4A, but in 4B, I want you to write down. Now, I wrote down celestial darkening. You guys can write down sun and moon going dark or something along those lines, right? The sun, the moon, and the stars go dark or just celestial darkening, right? All the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars are going dark. And I just want you to write that down there so you have a point of reference, okay? You have a point of reference. So in 4B, in, in box 4B, please write celestial darkening, right? This is a biblical fact. You've got other references there. You can check it out for yourself if you want a bit more evidence on that uh, event to come in the future. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, guys, is read to you from Joel 2.31, okay? Because you remember how when we spoke about the sun and darkening and mentioned the day of the Lord. Well, what is it about the day of the Lord that's relevant to this event? I'm going to read to you from two passages in Joel 2.31. Let's start there. It says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Now notice, notice the next words. Before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Alright, so just think about those words. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So what... So when does the day of the Lord come? Before the sun and moon being darkened or after the sun and moon being darkened? Anyone? Uh, after the sun and moon being darkened, right? That's clear from scripture. So what I want you to do there in 5b, in 5b, right? Just write there, day of the Lord. Day of the Lord, right? The scriptures confirm to us that the day of the Lord comes after the celestial darkening. Okay? This is straightforward from the Bible. That was from Joel 2.31. But it's not just in the Old Testament. This is also found in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, verse 20. I'll just read it to you. It says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Okay? So Acts 2 quotes Joel chapter 2. This is, is found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. I love it when the Lord gives us at least two references of the same thing. All right? Because that way you know, oh yeah, like this is so obvious. Like, you know, you don't have someone that's trying to uh, mess this up. But that, that's easy, right? You know, and, and, and as we build this, you're going to see just how easy it is to piece this together. The only thing stopping you from understanding this doctrine is the things you've learned over the many years that you've been in church. You know, the books that you've read. You know, all the fictional books left behind. All the rapture movies, uh, you know, that, that you've watched. And, and all the preconceived ideas that you have in your head. If you're willing to let go of this, this doctrine is super, super easy to understand. I promise you that, okay? As long as you have the right references, it'll point you in the right direction. Now, we read from Matthew 24. If you can take your Bibles, please turn to Matthew 24, uh, because that's probably one of the passages that I want you to stay in. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Because as uh, our brother Michael was, was reading from Matthew 24, you may have noticed that this was referenced as well. The sun and the moon going dark. Matthew 24, verse 29. The Bible says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So what does the Bible say? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, right? After the tribulation. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Alright, now, I'm going to read to you another reference. Mark 13, verse 24. It's just, it's the same teaching from Christ. I just want to read to you from another passage. It says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. So, what comes first? The tribulation... Or the celestial darkening? 
Anyone? According to what we read? Tribulation. The tribulation. And then the celestial darkening, right? I mean, this is clear. Two passages from the Bible making this super clear. So what I'm going to write there in 3b, in 3b, before the celestial darkening, as the Bible said, it is the great tribulation. You can write down the great tribulation if you want, okay? The great tribulation or just tribulation. Tribulation or great tribulation. Uh, maybe great tribulation because that Jesus does give it that name as well. All right? Great tribulation in 3b. <laughs> Okay, so we're, we're just putting this together, right? We're just going from the Word of God. I'm not have, I'm not, I don't have to read this and, and give you my opinion and give you some complicated answer. We're just straight what the Bible says. We're just writing this down, all right? Now, um, if you want to keep a finger there in Matthew 24, please turn to Revelation chapter 6. It's also another important passage that we're going to turn to. If you just want to keep a finger in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, they're going to be the main text that we read from. Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. Matthew 24. And uh, so I hope you can see how important this event is so far. Of the sun and moon being dark and the stars falling from heaven. Because the Bible tells us what comes after. The Bible tells us what comes before. And the Bible also tells us when this happens. Okay, It's found in Revelation chapter 6 verse 12. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12. Okay, and I, look, I'm not going to have time to go through all the Bible prophecy stuff, but I just want to focus on the rapture. Okay, but Revelation chapter six verse twelve says, "And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casts off her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind." So I'll just read that one more time. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sap of his hair, and the moon became as blood. So when does this happen? Which seal in the book of Revelation? Anyone? The sixth seal. So what I want you to write in 4a, 4a, above celestial darkening, I want you to write there, sixth seal. Okay, the sixth seal. That's when it happens. Alright? We know what happens after the day of the Lord. We know what happens before the tribulation. We know when it happens. The sixth seal. Alright? So, um, yes, yeah, seal. S E A L. Seal. So, if you know the book of Revelation, you're probably familiar with the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. We won't, we won't be able to have time to go for the trumpet and the vials today, okay? But the sixth seal. So, I hope just straight away. It's starting to put it all together, right? If you keep your focus on this event, on the sun and moon and the stars, it's all starting to come together for you, okay? Now, go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. The Bible says, When ye therefore shall see the, pay attention to these words, the abomination of desolation. I know it's a big word, but you're going to have to write that down soon. When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. <laughs> And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. But look at verse 21. Notice verse 21. For then, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Alright? So you saw there in verse 21. That's when Jesus mentions the great tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation. So what was before the great tribulation? It's that long word, right? In, in verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Now if you've got, you got your Bibles there, you'll be able to spell that out. But just in, in box 2B, box 2B, please write abomination of desolation, right? Makes sense, right? The abomination of desolation, then the great tribulation. That's what we just read in Matthew 24. So in box 2B, please write abomination of desolation. And if you can't spell it, just write A-O-D. Okay, A-O-D. Abomination of desolation. 
Now, what's interesting about this passage, guys, is in verse 15, Jesus said, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, obviously, we know the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, right? God says, uh, Jesus says, he goes, whoso readeth, let him understand. So what's Jesus telling us? He says, look, please read the book of Daniel so you can fully understand what I'm talking about. All right. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to turn to Daniel chapter 9. You don't need to turn there. I can just read it out to you. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Because we want to understand a little bit about this abomination of desolation. Okay? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The Bible says, And he, speaking of the Antichrist, speaking of the beast to come in the future, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, if you know about Bible prophecy, all right, again, I don't have time to go through all of this, but there are 70 weeks that were prophesied of Daniel. In fact, we covered some of this before, all right? And each week represented a period of seven years. Instead of seven days, those weeks represented seven years, all right? And there's still this one week to come when the Antichrist comes upon this earth. And that's the last week left, the one week. And then it says, sorry, uh, we've made it for one week and in the midst of the week in the midst of the week what does midst mean? M-I-D-S-T middle in the middle or in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate that's what Jesus spoke about the desolation of abominations um, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate so what I wanted to write here, guys, above 2B, where you wrote abomination of desolation, in 2A, we know when it happens. So just right there in the midst of the week, or the middle of the week, the middle of that seven-year period that is still to come in the future. Just right above there, in the midst of the week, we're going to see that abomination of desolation. All right? That's what the Bible says. All right, uh, in the midst of the week, uh, 2A, 2A, all right. Now, let me just quickly explain to you, without going through all the passages, it appears that when the Antichrist comes, that he reestablishes some Old Testament practices, such as sacrificing animals, okay? That's what it appears to be in the old, in the new, uh, when, when the Antichrist comes. And in the new temple, they may very well be sacrificing animals, which will be just a spit in the face of Jesus Christ, who was our ultimate sacrifice, right? Look, the Lord that takes no pleasure in the sacrifice of animals. The, the reason animals were sacrificed in the Old Testament was to be a type, was to be a picture, was to be a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and His blood that was going to be shed for us, okay? And so for the Antichrist to reestablish a covenant of sacrifice, it just shows, you know, how, how there's blaspheme in the name of Christ there. But then He's going to cause that to cease. He's going to cause that to stop. And if you know the story of the Antichrist, he's going to come and claim himself to be Christ. Right? Just like Christ, with, with his sacrifice, he put an end to the Old Testament okay, and the sacrificial system. He's going to do, try to do the same thing. right? Establish sacrifices, then step in and say, he's Christ, and put an end to the sacrifice there. That's what the abomination of, uh, of desolation is all about. But I haven't got time to teach all of that. Okay? Now... I do want to point out one thing. I'm going to read to you from Daniel 11, verse 31. The Bible says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. That's what I'm referring to. They're going to take away that daily sacrifice of animals, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. I'm going to read to you from verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, speaking of the Antichrist, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for, uh, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers. He's not going to even you know, acknowledge the god of the Bible. Nor the desire of women, nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all. So he's going to say, he's going to exa you know, exalt himself above you know, Jesus Christ, above God the Father, you know, above, above probably all the other gods or the false religions. And he's going to claim to be the resurrected Christ, claim to be God himself, 
and exalting himself. Okay, that, that's important for you to just keep in the back of your mind for, uh, for future. All right. Go back to Matthew 24 if you turned away. Matthew 24. I hope your, your, your graph is coming together. All right. We're building it on the word of God. And what he just clearly says without me having to twist the scriptures. All right. Matthew 24 verse 4. Matthew 24 verse 4. And Jesus answered unto them. And sorry. And said unto them. Take heed that no man deceive you. Guys. You, you might be wondering why there's so many positions on the end times. Why do so many people have different opinions and interpretations on the end times and timing of Christ? And is there a future tribulation? And, and is it pre? Is it, is it pre wrath Is it post? Look, Jesus said there's going to be deception. All right? And this is why I just want you guys to write this down and know what the Word of God says. All right? There's deception. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. So keep that in mind, the, the wars and rumors of wars. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. Keep that in mind. Famines as well. And pestilences. Keep that in mind. And earthquakes in diverse places. All over the place. Verse 8. Now look at this. All these... All these that we just read about, you know, the nation against nation, and pestilences, famines, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, jump. so what I'm going to do, oh, we won't do it just yet. So we're talking about the beginning of sorrows. Now, if you look at verse 15, look at verse 15, Matthew 24, verse 15. It says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, so I just want to point your attention there. In verse 15, it speaks about the abomination of desolation. But what did Jesus Christ mention before that? The beginning of sorrows, right? The beginning of sorrows, nations against nations, pestilences, famines, and earthquakes. That is the beginning of sorrows before the abomination of desolation. Okay? So what I want you to write in 1B, what do you think it's going to be? What, what are you going to fill out in box 1B? The beginning of sorrows. Right? The beginning of sorrows. Because Matthew 24 said that the beginning of sorrows and then the abomination of desolation. Alright? So, if you look at your graph so far, the beginning of sorrows. So, you should see, now this is starting to be filled out. I hope you haven't missed anything. Because if you miss it, maybe it gets a bit jumbled up. Okay? But 1B, one, one you should write in there, beginning of sorrows. Alright, now, we're going to focus away from the first graph for a moment and look down at the second graph, the second graph, where it says the beginning of sorrows, you see what that's written there? The beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24, and then Revelation 6, seals 1 to 4. Okay, that's where I want you to move your focus to right now. Let's just learn a little bit more about the beginning of sorrows, and let's see how it correlates with Revelation chapter 6. So I really want you to just flick through, guys. One finger in Matthew 24, one finger in Revelation chapter 6. Okay, and we're going to flick back and forth. Because I want you to see how similar these two things are. The Bible is 100% consistent. Okay? Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And if you, this, is, this is about the seals. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, the first seal, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder... One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And by the way, I believe this is the Antichrist. And then he goes, And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Alright? So, most end time teachers believe this is a reference to the Antichrist. Okay? It doesn't matter if they're pre, post, or whatever. Most people would point to this and, and recognize. That is the Antichrist. Coming and conquering nations. Okay? He's taken over nations. Right? But uh, notice that he comes on a white horse. And what did Jesus say? I don't think I read it to you. Sorry. Uh, in Matthew 24 verse 5. Go, to, go back to Matthew 24 verse 5. Again, we're just going to flick back and forth. So keep your fingers there. Matthew 24 verse 5. What did he say about the end times? He goes, For many shall come in my name. Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. 
So what does Jesus promise that's going to come in the end times? False Christs. Coming in His name. Coming to deceive. Right? And if we look at seal number 1 in Revelation chapter 6, what do we see? You know, the, 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 the rider on the white horse, which I do believe that is a reference to the Antichrist himself. There are many false Christs, there are many Antichrists, but there is one that is surely to come, which is the beast of the book of Revelation. Okay? So what I want you to do, guys, is in 6a, in 6a, so if you go, go to Begin Your Sorrows, Matthew 24, box 6a, I want you to write down false Christs. Okay? Matthew 24 told us about false Christs, right? Matthew 24, write down in 6a, false Christs. Now in 6b, what do I want you to write down? What did we see in Revelation 6? The Antichrist. Okay? The Antichrist. 6b, we see the Antichrist. And if you also want to write there, the white horse. White horse. Okay? The white horse. I want you to keep this stuff in mind. Okay? The false Christ and then the rider on the white horse. Okay? 6b. Alright, let's move on. I hope you're still in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 6. Matthew 24, verse 6. And then Jesus says, so after he mentions the false Christ, he says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. What are we seeing in Matthew 24? Anybody? What are we seeing? Sorry? Wars. We're seeing wars, right? We're seeing world wars. So what I'm going to write there in 7a, in 7a, this is seal number, uh, two, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that yet, but what we're seeing here, after the false Christs, are the wars and rumors of wars. Or if you just want to write world war, you can write that as well. You know, nation against nation, whatever, whatever is easier for you to write. Just write that down there in 7a. Okay, I'll give you a minute to write that. Now, flip back to Revelation 6. Flip back to Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verse 3. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. Now we're going to look at the second seal. What is the second seal? Revelation 6, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Hey, they're taking peace from the earth. What does that mean? If there's peace being taken away from the earth, what's going on in the earth? Wars, right? Wars. And keep reading. And that, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Hey, what does the sword represent? Warfare, right? It's a weapon of war. So what I want you to write in 7b in 7b is um, that peace is taken or, or yeah peace is taken and red horse as well red horse peace is taken and also write down the red horse okay so I hope this is coming clear to you right the box in 6b is the first seal the box in 6b uh, sorry 7b is the second seal Okay? And you can see how it lines up perfectly with the events that Jesus Christ is speaking of, one by one. Now, flip back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. We started to read it. It said, uh, In kingdom against kingdom, but what's next? And there shall be famines. And there shall be Famines. So what I want you to write, guys, in box 8A, box 8A is famines. Famines, a lack of food, right? 8A, famines. <coughs> and this makes perfect sense. If there's a worldwide war, okay, naturally, you know, the economy's going to suffer. Naturally, people aren't going to be able to go about their business and farming and all those kinds of things. And there's a drop of food. Uh, food. Okay, and people are going to be hungry, they're going to be famines. This, was, this happens in any, any kind of war scenario, okay? But go to Revelation chapter 6. Go back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. 
let's look at the third seal. The third seal. And let's see if this lines up with what Jesus speaks about in Matthew 24. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now that might not make a lot of sense to you, but in these days, a penny was a day's wage. If you worked uh, uh, just a standard job, you would earn a penny. Okay, so, I don't know, work out how much you, you earn a day. Okay, let's say, I don't know, let's say it's 150 bucks. Let's keep it simple, right? 150 bucks you earn a day for, for working, all right? That's what's going to cost you to purchase a measure of wheat. Okay, so if you want to feed your family and a measure of wheat is just a portion of wheat, it's going to cost you $150. Okay, why? Because there's famine, right? And when, they, when there's famine, when there's a shortage of food, guess what? The food prices skyrocket, you know? And, and the value of your dollar collapses. Okay, the value of your dollar collapses because people are more interested in food than they are in money. Okay? So we see that play out there, and then it says in three measures of barley for a penny. So you get a bit more barley for your day's wage, but it's well short of what you can buy. I mean, if you're going to be buying some wheat at, how much is wheat? At, 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 like, if you're going to buy some flour or something to bake bread, how much is that? A couple of bucks, maybe four bucks or something, I don't know, five bucks. All right? Imagine paying 150 bucks or whatever, right? a day's wage. That's what that situation is going to be because of the famines that take place there. So you can see that correlation take place between Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6. So, uh, sorry, I don't know if I told you yet. Uh, in 8b, in box 8b, I want you to write down uh, uh, a food, food shortage. I wrote down the wrong thing here. A food shortage. And then you can also write down the black horse. The black horse, okay? The black horse and a, a shortage of food, which lines up again with what Jesus said about the famines, okay? Now, flick back to, I'll give you one more minute to write that down if you can. Not one minute, but a few seconds. Um, go back to Matthew 24, verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. We didn't finish the, 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 the verse yet. What comes after the famines? Who's got the reference? Huh? Pestilences, right? And pestilences. So what I wanted to write down in 9a, and just ignore that black box there, that's just a mistake. But anyway, 9a, write down pestilences. 9a, box 9a, this is from the book of Matthew, write down pestilences. Now what are pestilences? Anyone? Diseases, yeah, diseases, sicknesses. You know, um, have you ever gone to work and maybe you've been sick and people have said to you, oh, you look pale. Well, they're not even at work. Maybe just, you know, at the family, you're not feeling well and you tend to lose a bit of color. People say you've lost color. People say you look pale. You know, you look sickly, right? Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Back to Revelation chapter 6. Verse 7. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. So now we're going to look at the fourth seal. And when he had opened the fourth seal... I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. So like a, you know, a sickly, a sickly looking horse, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. So it looks like with all this world war and this, these famines and the pestilences that Jesus speaks about, that a fourth of the whole earth are going to die and succumb at this point in time because of this. And obviously, when there's great deaths, this is when diseases spread. You've got all, you know, you obviously you have, you know, uh, rodents and mosquitoes carrying all kinds of diseases. But it's interesting that it even mentions um, and with the beasts of the earth. So it looks like wild beasts are going out and killing people as well. You know, and again, I don't know, does this, does this line up with the shortage of food? Maybe they're, maybe they're going through struggles and they're attacking humans and things like that uh, 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 for food. And that's, that's one possibility. But I'd just like you to notice just how well all of that 
um, comes together in the Bible. And then, uh, again, what did Jesus call all of this? He says, this, this is the beginning of sorrows, right? He talks about all these events and calls it the beginning of sorrows. And if you look at Revelation 6, we haven't got time to go through this, but this is the last time of the seals being referenced to a horse, okay? Uh, seal 1 is a white horse, seal 2 was a red horse, seal 3 was the black horse, and seal 4 was the pale horse. And then the other seals are not referenced to horses. It's like something <laughs> changes at that point in Revelation. And we do see that something does change in the book of uh, Matthew 24 as well, as you already wrote down. Because after the beginning of sorrows, you have the abomination of desolation. But I just want you to see how those two things go together. Okay. So now what I want you to write... Did you guys already write uh, death in uh, 9b? Has 9b been filled? Sorry guys, in uh, box 9b, write down death, okay, and write down pale horse. Death and pale horse. Because I think you should have already written pestilences in 9a. So, are all your bottom boxes filled out now? They should be, right? Sorry, mine's all filled out, so I'm sort of struggling to follow a little bit. Uh, it should be all filled out, okay? So, what I wanted to show you with this is the correlation, again, between Matthew 24 Specifically, the beginning of sorrows and Revelation chapter 6, specifically the first four seals and the four uh, horsemen. Okay, the, the four horsemen. So, now that we've looked at that, what I want you to write down in 1A, the top left corner, the box, sorry, the top left box is seals 1 to 4, or seals 1 dash 4. Okay, that's it, or just seals 1, 2, 3, 4 if you want, okay. Just write down something like that. Because you'll see that's correlated with the beginning of sorrows. Alright? The beginning of sorrows, seals 1 to 4, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Alright. Now, if you look at your box, if you look at your, your, um, your table at the top there, so 1A, you've got seals 1 to 4, right? And then in 2A, you've got the midst of the week, yes? In 3A, it's empty right now. And then in 4A, you've got the sixth seal, right? That should be, that hopefully everyone's got that. So without even reading the Bible, let's just forget the Bible for a minute, just using logic. What should 3A be? Anybody? You've got seals 1 to 4, in 1A, you've got seal 6 in 4A. What seal are we missing? Seal number 5. Seal number 5. Now, don't write it in just yet. Let's get the, let's get the proof from the Bible. I just want to use logic a little bit there. 3A should be the fifth seal. And 3A should be the fifth seal. Go to Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24, verse 8. Matthew 24, verse 8. Matthew 24, verse 8. Matthew 24, verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We read that already, right? Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Hey, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, some people reject Matthew 24 and they say it's not for the New Testament believer, it's not for the New Testament church. They say it's for the unsaved Jews. And yet what we see Jesus speaking about you, and they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Hey, the only people that carry the name of Christ, you know, are, are Christians, are believers. Right? Judaism hates the Lord Jesus Christ. They reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not going to be... Look, they might be suffering during this time, but if they're suffering, they're not suffering for the name of Christ. Let's put it that way, right? It's the people of God, it's His believers, it's His church that is suffering for His name's sake. Alright? But notice that it comes after the beginning of sorrows. We already saw there's a lot of warfare on the earth. The whole earth is, is, uh, is suffering during this time. But when we get to Matthew chapter 24 verse 9, now He's going for those that name Jesus Christ. Now He's going for the believers. Alright? 
So what I want you to actually, no, I don't want you to write anything there. But if you look at 3B, what did you, what did we write down in 3B? The great tribulation, the great tribulation. And what did Jesus say? They're going to come and kill you. They're going to come and persecute you. Hey, that is tribulation. Something that you need to understand, okay? And if you believe in the preacher of rapture, right now you're probably shaking your head going, no, no, no. The tribulation is when God pours out His wrath on the earth. Why would God pour out His wrath on His people? It's because God's wrath is not the tribulation. The tribulation, and if you look up tribulation in all your Bible, it's always the world, it's always the devil persecuting God's people. The tribulation. All right, And then in answer to the tribulation, God will later pour out His wrath, pour out His judgment upon the ungodly world, upon the armies of the beasts. Okay? But that is the wrath of God upon the earth. The tribulation is the world or, or the Antichrist persecuting believers. These are two different things and I'm going to prove this to you as we go on. All right? So, we said this should be the fifth seal. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Go back to Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, what, what should we expect to see? What did we just read about? Ah, people killing believers. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. What's that? Killed. For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Hey, they're being slain. They were killed for the testimony that they had. They were killed for the word of God. Hey, these are believers that were put to death here at the fifth seal. Do you see how well it comes together? Right? We don't need to force it. You know, it, 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 it unravels itself when we compare scripture with scripture. So what I want you to write there in 3a, if you haven't already, is the fifth seal. The fifth seal. The fifth seal is the great tribulation. Okay? Where the Antichrist specifically persecutes God's people. Specifically persecutes those that have the name of Christ. Those that hold to the word of God. Okay? Now, how, how many boxes do you still need to fill out on the top? Just one more? Is it um, 5A? 5A. Alright. Now, I'm going to read to you from Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14. I mean, I can turn anywhere, but I'm just I'm turning. Because the day of the Lord, guys, you see there in, in, in 5b, it's day of the Lord. We want to learn about the day of the Lord. Okay? What is the day of the Lord? Okay, this is what we want to learn about. There's so many references in the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament. But I'm just going to read to you some of the better ones. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14. It says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath. What is the day of the Lord? It is the day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men. They shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. And whose wrath is the day of the Lord? It's the Lord's wrath. It's God's wrath against the wicked. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedily riddance of all them that dwell in the land. That's Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14 to 18. I think I've got the reference there. Yeah, I do. Isaiah, now I'm going to read to you another passage. Isaiah 13 verse 9. Isaiah 13 verse 9. Again, you've got the reference down there. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath, and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So what is the day of the Lord? Is there any doubt? I mean, I can, I can, I can read so many other passages. 
The Bible's super clear about this. The day of the Lord is the day of God's wrath. Okay? So what I want you to write there in 5a, in 5a, is God's wrath. God's wrath. Okay? God's wrath. So hope, now this should be filled out. We're, we're pretty much done now, okay? But I just wanted to understand, guys, and we haven't even spoken about the rapture just yet, but I just wanted to piece together some pieces of the scriptures, put them together, and, and show you these things. Now, if you look at your top um, table, guys, you'll notice that the two, there are two arrows, right? There are two arrows pointing up, okay? Now, these two arrows are supposed to represent the rapture, okay? What is the rapture? It's when the Lord comes back and gives us our resurrected bodies. Praise God. We don't have to deal with this fleshly, sinful nature forever. Okay? God's going to come back. You know, if, if you're in the grave, if you're dead by then, you're, you're still going to make the rapture. Because God's going to bring His saints with Him, those that have slept in Christ. He's going to bring them with Him. They're going to get their new resurrected body and be caught up with the Lord in the air. They're going to go first. And then those that are here on that last day, that last generation of the New Testament church, those that remain on the earth, they're going to also, we'll go into this uh, probably next week, but uh, they're also going to be taken up in the air to be forever with the Lord with their new resurrected bodies. Now, the reason I put the first arrow there is because this is where the pre-tribulation believers say the rapture takes place. They say it takes place here before the beginning of sorrows, before any of this stuff starts to take place. Okay? And... Um, and definitely before the tribulation, all right. But uh, for for the pre-tribulation believers, they call the the entire seven-year period. They call that the entire seven-year period the tribulation or the great tribulation. Okay. But the Bible says that the great tribulation comes after the abomination of desolation, which is when the antichrist establishes himself as a new god, a new Christ. That, that's what Matthew twenty-four clearly says. Okay. We don't, we don't have to change that. And then the second arrow. So I've just got it there, just for your reference. The second arrow that comes after the Great Tribulation and after the Celestial Darkening, that is the rapture position that I'm teaching you guys today. Okay? It's post-tribulational, meaning it's after the Tribulation. Now, I don't want you thinking seven years here. I'm just, just thinking Tribulation, which is after the abomination of the Celestial. My personal opinion is probably just a few weeks. All right? I've got some reasons for that. I'll probably go to it next week. But before... God's wrath. Before, uh, before the Lord's wrath, on the day of the Lord, it will take place. Okay? As, as God starts to get himself ready to pour out his wrath upon the earth. Which is why the position that we hold here as a church is commonly known as the post-tribulation, pre-wrath rapture. Okay? Post-tribulation, pre-wrath rapture. So the idea is, we're going to be here for the Antichrist. He's going to reveal himself. He's going to persecute believers, okay, the final generation of God's people, and those that manage to get through that time will then be raptured to be with the Lord before God turns around and pours out His wrath on the earth. Now, go back to Matthew 24. Go back to Matthew 24. Let's look at this very quickly. I'm almost wrapping up. So for those that came in a bit later... This is part one. Next week, we're, we're doing part two. I'm going to build on this a little bit more. Matthew 24. I didn't want to keep you here for two hours, so I cut it in, in half. Matthew 24, uh, verse... Sorry, guys. One moment. Verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. Let's just finish on this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. We saw this. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. <coughs> so, hey, Matthew 24 is consistent with the passages that we saw in Joel and in Acts. Okay? And then look at verse 30. And then, hey, what's the word then? Following, right? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hey, they all see Jesus Christ. It's not a secret rapture. It's not something that just disappears. He's here one minute and gone the next. 
They all, all the tribes of the earth mourn when they see Christ come in. And verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, we just read that. Let's, let's finish off on the memory verse. The memory verse that you guys memorized in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Actually, before we read verse 7, let's read verse 4. Why is the book of Revelation written, guys? Look at verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Who's John writing to? The churches. Those that are saved. Those that are washed in the blood of Christ. Look at verse 6. And have made us. What an honor. Have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's, who's he writing to? Again, to I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but this is important. To the New Testament church. Verse 7. Behold! Hey, what does behold mean? It means look. Fix your eyes upon this. This is important. Pay attention. Look. Behold. He cometh with clouds. That's what Matthew 24 said. And every eye shall see him. The Bible said in... Sorry, Matthew 24 said every, every, uh, every tribe... Sorry, every... Tribe of all the earth will see him, right? And they also which pierced him, so even the Israelites, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail. What did Matthew 24 say? They shall mourn. Hey, mourn. It's the same thing when you're wailing, you're mourning, you're sorrowing, you're crying out. When you wail. Because of him, even so. Amen. What's the instruction to the New Testament church? To watch. It's not a secret rapture. Watch is come with clouds and all the nations of the earth will see him and they're going to wail. The unbelieving world are going to be wailing and mourning because as we saw in, in what's following here, God's going to pour out his wrath upon the earth. God's going to unleash the trumpets. He's going to unleash the vials and it's just going to literally going to be hell on earth uh, during that time. But praise God for us. We behold, we fix our eyes upon Christ. You know, we, we, you, know you might say it's a bit scary. Hey, but there are believers right now on this earth that are being put to death, that are being persecuted, that are fearful for their lives. Okay? And I truly believe if we're the generation that goes through this time, that the Spirit of the Lord is going to empower us, is going to give us boldness, and we're going to be able to get through this, even though right now we might think of it as a scary thing. And if you feel that way, if it gives you fear, what should that drive you to do? That should drive you to draw closer to the Lord. It should drive you to uh, know the scriptures more. It should drive you to rely less on your own self and rely more on the power of God in your life. Hey, and if we're not the generation that experiences this, could be a hundred years from now, who knows, right? It could be a hundred years from now, but still, hey, even in this earth, there could be local tribulation, there could be local warfare, there could just be struggles and, and difficulties in your life. But if you prepared yourself for hardship as a believer, you're going to be more successful and more in the will of God to overcome these challenges in our life. Okay? So I'll leave it there, guys. If you have any questions, please let me know. But uh, next week, we're going to go through part two. Okay, let's pray.